I'm actually excited to talk about, uh, thank you very much, talk about a couple of my stories, uh, climate change stories for the Post and Courier. Um, I don't know about you, but I tend to get a little worked up about this climate change stuff. So, you know, so much so that I'm, I guarantee you that I'm going to lose my train of thought. So, if you don't mind, I'd like for all of us to take two deep breaths together, two deep cleansing breaths at the count of three. If you would, one, two, three, take a deep breath in and let it out. Take a second breath in and let it go. Great. Oh yeah, climate change, right. So, so that second breath that we all took together, you could say that it came from the ocean. Why the ocean? Well, we know that you know, plants on land produce oxygen through photosynthesis, but so do these beautiful microscopic jewels hidden in the waves. They're called phytoplankton, and they crank out a ton of oxygen. How much? Well, more than 50% of the oxygen that we breathe comes from phytoplankton, or every other breath. That was the name of a story we did a couple of years ago, and uh, every other breath. And we, we thought hard about, you know, why aren't people talking about phytoplankton, the stuff that produces half of the oxygen, you know? And, you know, where is the sense of urgency, really, in, about climate change in general, you know? So I think the answer has to do with this. Snakes. So got a question for y'all. You're walking down a path, and you see a rattlesnake two feet in front of you. What are you not going to do? Shout it out. What are you not going to do? Step on it. No. All right. So what you're not going to do is debate. You're not going to procrastinate. I guarantee you that your brain is going to, your neural wiring is going to, is going to go berserk, and your amygdala, you know, that, that's your brain's freakout center, is going to go apeshit, and it's in a flash, it's going to tell you to get the fuck out of the way. <laughs> right? So, so, you know, our brains are wired to respond to immediate and visible threats. But it's, they're not, it's not wired that well to respond to invisible threats. Right? Or distant threats or future threats. So if you think about it, CO2, methane, you know, they are invisible snakes, right? We can't see them, can't touch them, can't feel them. But what if we could? And that led us to another uh, project that we did called Chasing Carbon. And I actually got the idea from David Quick, um, who uh, worked with me at the Post and Courier, and one day he came over to me and, and said, Tony, you know, I just saw this really cool documentary. Um, some filmmakers used a uh, carbon dioxide camera, could detect carbon dioxide, kind of like a thermal imaging camera can detect heat signatures. And I thought, that's a cool idea. So I called up the company that makes the, the, uh, the camera, and I said, hey, can I borrow your camera? And they said, yeah, no problem, you know, but just, just don't break it. It costs $80,000. It's the only one of its kind in the United States. <laughs> so don't break it. I said, okay, I won't break it. And they, they FedEx the camera to me. They FedEx an $80,000 camera to the Post and Courier. So I got the camera, and I went around town, and I started taking pictures of things that, um, that, that produce carbon dioxide. And it, I'm going to show you a couple of these pictures here, because I really changed the way I see the world. So, so this, uh, this one here, this is just a tailpipe, right? Internal combustion engine. You know, we've done a pretty good job of getting rid of the soot and the smoke and all that stuff. But look at what the CO2 camera shows. You know, just a blowtorch of CO2. And multiply that by millions and millions. Now, this one I, I like, too. So that's lawn equipment. That, you know, they're bleak blowers. They produce a ton of CO2. They're horrible. But check out these buses, too. And that, I love the bike going by. But look at how these diesel engines on these car buses are cranking out enormous amounts of CO2. I love the bike, not doing much. <laughs> so here, this one I think is really important. So this is a power plant. It's called a peaker plant. And it's um, uh, up on the neck, not too far from here. And it's called a peaker plant because it produces energy during peak demand. So usually in the summer or the winter. It runs on natural gas. You know, and you'll, you'll often hear, oh, you know, natural gas, clean burning natural gas. And, you know, to the naked eye, pretty benign, right? But check out what the CO2 camera does shows a fracking blowtorch of CO2 
So, you know, as I was walking around town, you know, taking pictures of all this stuff, my mind actually drifted back to Tanzania. And I had spent a few months there a few years before working on a book about a brain surgeon. And, and it was in a very remote part of Tanzania. And I remember my favorite thing to do was to walk into town at night and go get a beer. And I did it. it was, the path was pitch dark, except for the cook fires in the huts along the way. So you could see the fires, and you could, uh, you could smell the wood smoke, and you hear the crackle of the fires. The fires were there in your face. You could see them. But here, you know, in the developed world, we've done a, a very good job of hiding our combustion, cloaking our fires. And if you think about it, you know, those tailpipes, those cars, you know, they are essentially moving cook fires. Next time you go, go down the street, think of all the moving invisible cook fires that are going down the road. You know, flip a light switch, that's a fire at a power plant miles away, out of sight, out of mind. But my epiphany as I was kind of walking around and taking pictures was that we were surrounded by invisible fires. And that helps us understand what we should do. We need to put out fires. Now we're cranking out a ton of heat, and you know this heat is warming the ocean, and it's doing some things um, also to our ocean currents that also is a very significant issue that not a lot of people are talking about. We did a project called Into the Gulf Stream, and um, as you know, the Gulf Stream flows off our coast. What you might not know is that it flows with such force and momentum that it actually pulls the ocean away from our coast, like a centrifuge. And that this pulling motion is so powerful that it lowers our sea level three feet. Now you're thinking, oh, yeah, is that really a thing? Well, in 2009, scientists were measuring the velocity of the Gulf Stream current and when they suddenly found that it slowed by 15%. They were freaking out. They'd never seen anything like that. And what happened was, seas rose in New England five inches for about eight or nine months. And it flooded more here. So it has a very direct impact. Now, one of the things to know about the Gulf Stream is that it flows north toward Greenland, and then the warm waters in that current um, cool, and then they sink, and then they flow south on the bottom of the ocean, forming another current, and then they reconnect with the Gulf Stream, creating this conveyor belt, this great conveyor belt, which actually helps moderate our planet's climate. So I don't know, any of you seen any weird weather lately? <laughs> so what's happening with the ocean currents is a clue, because if it, if it slows down, we're going to see more extreme weather, which is what we're seeing, right? So. Uh, I mentioned Greenland. Um, we went there this summer for another climate change story. We, uh, we called it the Greenland Connection um, because there are a lot of what's happening here is related to what's happening in Greenland. Now, the thing to know about Greenland, other than it's just spectacularly beautiful, um, is that it's huge. It's a giant, giant island of ice. And it's not just a little bit of ice. It's ice that's five to 10,000 feet high. And, it, and it, ice covers an area three times the size of Texas. And you know, you know what happens when you? I'm sure some of you have probably put ice cubes in a in a drink and put too many ice cubes in it, so it makes a mess. Well, that's exactly what's happening in Greenland. The ice sheet's flowing into the ocean. It's breaking off, making these awesome icebergs. But it's you know like ice cubes in a cup. It's making the ocean rise. But what a lot of people aren't also uh, thinking about is how all this water, all this fresh water is flowing south into that conveyor belt, gumming it up. So as a result of what's happening in Greenland and all these fires that we're making, we're making seas rise. And you know, we're seeing it here as we're seeing it, you know, last week. You know, it's, seas used to rise about an inch every decade. Now we're you know we're going up to almost three inches a decade. It's gonna be four, five, six or seven. The, the climate is, uh, the sea rise is accelerating. That's the important thing to understand is, you know, the climate's always changed, right? Well, you know, the climate, it, the real story is that it, the, about the pace of change, how it's speeding up. So these are some of the, a couple of my stories uh, I've been doing. I really, when I'm working on climate change stories, I feel like that's my most important work because, because of the stakes. And, you know, I really believe also the climate change stories are going to what are they will help save the planet. You know, 
our, our climate change stories are our angels. You know, they are, you know, we've always used stories to, to learn, to learn lessons, you know, from, you know, from the Bible to Bruce Springsteen, from the Torah to <laughs> Toni Morrison. Stories are how we learn about the world, how we may learn how to make better decisions. They're the gifts we give each other. So uh, I would ask you to all learn a few climate change stories. Tell your friends these climate change stories. Tell your family. Tell people who don't want to hear them. Because, again, they're gifts that we give each other to live better lives. So for the climate's sake, let's give each other good ones. Thank you. Thank you, Tony.